All right, so 1 Peter 3, 8 through 22. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. All right, so we'll continue on with this last part of our E3 study on this section, and we'll move on to the next one. So up next is how would we summarize Peter's message to his original audience? And we can start by reminding ourselves who the original audience was. We've done this like three weeks Jewish in a row. So. Believers. Right, so. Hey. Hey, good morning. Hello. All right, so we've got the, the Jewish believers, and they were in exile, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. This is after the Discipline, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so this would have been written after Rome crushed, crushed them up. Jerusalem and scattered everybody gotcha. and all that. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> yep. All right. Uh, and then any any other details about who the original audience was before we get into what he was communicating to them? Well, I mean, they were being persecuted. Yep. Because persecution was starting to break out, especially. Do we have like an exact date? this book I don't think we do uh, I want to s- was it the 60s Se- 60s or 70s because then Nero would have been in power and then they were definitely being persecuted yeah let me scroll up real fast and see if I can uh, we're looking yeah mid mid 60s AD okay yep. so Nero would have been um, yeah you know, on a local level they were experiencing persecution yes so um, yeah so they would have started the persecution was started um, already um, and, all right, anything else? And we'll, other, otherwise, we'll get right. What's the summary? Persevere. Persevere. Here. All right, so <clears throat> he, he gives them some instructions, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of how to be? I would say, like, to suffer for righteousness. Okay. Definitely. Or good, either way, because that both words are used. So good, good. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. He calls them to suffer for righteousness and not for evil. Uh, and then he he gives them instructions in verses eight through uh, twelve about how to be right. So he calls them to certain aspects of living. other aspects we could summarize so I'm thinking like maybe 18 through 21 how would we summarize that because that's kind of a different block of, of subject matter so for Christ also suffered once and then he talks about baptism how would we summarize that aspect of his message so this is going to be a lot of paraphrasing that's fine. But that's that's, that's that's the goal. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of paraphrasing. But basically, he's talking 
about being made baptism in life and spirit. If you really okay. want to like do it, like break it down, Barney style. The baptism in life and the spirit through Christ. Now, someone jogged my memory. Have we discussed the phrasing or the 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 way that he writes this in verse 21 where it says baptism which corresponds to this now saves you have we talked about that no. kind of well, I, think, I think we, I think we didn't do a deep dive that last week right. yeah, we I think we were talking about the, that at the end of last week and saying how it's like the correlation to yes that. so let's exactly. kind of hit that for a minute um, we don't need to spend 30 minutes on this but and, and you can always read more on your own time in a commentary perhaps but you know, to our ears, that sounds a little strange, right? Baptism, which corresponds now, saves you, because like we, when we had baptism, was it last week? We had baptism yeah, last, last week. week. We didn't say or affirm that the person being dunked just got saved. Uh, the, the pastors who are doing the baptism are already affirming before that that they've come to repentance and faith in Christ that they're saved. So how do we handle this? Before I say my piece, any thoughts? How do we handle this phrasing? Because the challenge, obviously, is that we don't believe that you're saved by works right. or anything you do. So what? how do we, how do we deal with this? I actually kind of want to hear yours first before I say what I'm going to say. No, no, that's not ah, how this works. It right. <laughs> did me to spit falling with no real thought into it. Um, the baptism saving us could be a sort of just like, like a metaphor, like playing off the symbolism of baptism on, um, like just like communion on its own, like it, it's bread and wine, it doesn't do anything for you. It's like your your mindset behind it on like the goal of baptism, it's like the water's not doing anything, it's just water. But if like, if you're in that right place, um, then like what's going on inside of you during that baptism can't save you. Yeah, yeah, and so the key aspect of that is uh, the back half of 21 where it says, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body. So like literally what the water is doing is not relevant here. Uh, it, no. no, please go, go ahead. ahead. Please. No, go oh, ahead. Okay. Um, it's not that it saves you. It is that it's a spiritual affirmation of the faith that you already hold. Yeah. Um, because like it's considered, it's, a, it's an ordinance. It's what it's considered a holy ordinance, and it's considered an affirmation of the faith. And it's if somebody doesn't want to get baptized, it's kind of like because there is a correlation between belief and baptism mm -hmm. in the Bible. Yeah, belief it's should not, lead to baptism. Right? Belief should lead to baptism because it's a public proclamation of your faith. But it's not that it saves you but it's a correlation of like that confirmation aspect of you becoming a Christian. Yes. I was, was going to say like just a quick summary of all that. It's like it, it seems like he's using like the language of an outward action to refer to um, what's going on internally. So I'm going to say Language of outward action to reflect internal change. Yes. Does that work for you, Matt? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So here's how I would uh, look at it. So in verse 21, now this is ESV, so if you don't have ESV, this may look slightly different. But So verse 21 says, baptism, comma, and then it gives a couple phrases, which corresponds now saves you. And then after it says, um, as we're brought up as an appeal to God for good conscience, comma, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the way I think of it in terms of like, what's the point being made here? I would read it as baptism, comma, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what's saving you. Does that make sense? Because it's Christ's baptism Separation. and death and resurrection, that is what's saving Because when we baptize you, we are simulating being buried. What's the phrase? I don't have the memory. Buried Christ in baptism, raised, raised to walk in the midst of Right. So we are, so that's the point. So, so I would, uh, to paraphrase it, or not so much paraphrase, but just to, to kind of dice it up a little bit to make it simpler to understand, baptism, comma, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that's the point, is that you're being baptized into his life, death, and resurrection.
for yourself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's kind of it's kind of like a partaking of, in a sense. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. like uh, just like how communion is a partaking of yeah. being a Christian. So baptism is like you initiating that you're partaking of Christ. Yes, you are symbolically partaking of His life, death, just as you're symbolically partaking of His bread, death and resurrection, body and blood. Yes, right. Yes, because uh, like Matt said, we don't believe that the bread and wine literally turn into his body and blood, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we believe, likewise with baptism, <laughs> it's not the water that does something to you, it is the act of submission to Christ and identifying with him in that. Okay, we handled that way easier and way faster than I thought we would. Thought well done, everybody. A, there is a <laughs> book by a guy named Thomas Schreiner, if anybody is interested, that goes through all the aspects of baptism. Uh, I'm guessing it's spelled like this. No. Oh, okay. S C H. Yeah. It's a it's a funky spelling. S C H R I E N E R. Oh come on, man. Schreiner. <laughs> <laughs> so Schreiner. Schreiner. Okay. See, that, that's what I'm thinking. Like this. Uh, yeah, what's the name, what's that's the name, how, that's what's the name funny. of the book. Maybe we should just do that it's, when you Google the name of the book. It's like you if you go if you like look that up on Amazon and just put baptism, it'll be like one of the first books that pops up. Okay. And it's basically got a book that's got different authors for each chapter from different denominations, oh. but it covers all aspects of baptism. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because so like if you really want to get in depth to it, you can look that book. Up. Yeah, we don't need to do a deep dive on this, but like for yeah. instance, our Presbyterian brothers and sisters would have a radically different view of this, uh -huh. substantially. And then you got Pago Baptists. Yes. Who are really, really out there. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, all right. So great job. That was awesome. That was way less painful than I thought it was going to be. All right. So if do you have anyone else want to add anything to like the summary aspect of Peter's message to the original audience? No, that's fine. All right. Very good. So we'll move on then to the respond section, where now we're going to look at this passage uh, more inwardly, how it affects us in terms of what does it tell us to know, be, and do. And we will go as in any order we want to. We can jump around, whatever you want to do. So again, more of a self-application angle this time. So we, re so as you're looking through this, what is what would Peter or the Holy Spirit want me to know, me to be, and me to do. And we can also add current context examples as well. Um, something for no. Uh, he wants us to know, like, our reason for the hope that is in us. So, like, as believers. Hey, hey, come on in. <laughs> I got two spots right here for you. I'm just getting close to you. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark. Tim. Tim, nice to meet you, Tim. Hey. Good to see you. We are in 1 Peter 3 and 22. We are wrapping up this block of scripture this week. <laughs> that works too. Sorry. Yeah, so we're going to wrap up this and we'll be in a new section next week. But nice to see you both. All right, so uh, I'm sorry, Kelly. Lost my train of thought. We need to what? We need to know, like, our reason for hope. Or the hope that is in us. So, like, because it's talking about, like, being prepared. Like, we need to know, like, for ourselves, like, I guess, like, the reason that we have for the hope that we have. That wasn't very short, but yeah. No, you're fine. We will, we can, we will save and erase if we, if we, because there's a lot here for us to know, be, and do. So I expect yeah. we may end up having to take a picture, erase, and keep going. Okay. All right. Um, so. So I guess with that, like, we need to be prepared. Yes. I was going to say, if you want to add that corollary to that, be prepared to give defense. And I, I don't think it's a big leap to go ahead and say we should be giving a defense. Okay. And we talked about this uh, earlier, but I'm going to, I'm going to, as a reminder, and as part of our do action, we're going to give our defense of the faith winsomely. Uh, in the text, it says, uh, with gentleness and humility, I believe. Uh, gentleness and respect. I'll just summarize both words to say we're supposed to do it in a winsome manner, meaning that we're not supposed to 
We're not supposed to turn people off in the way that we defend Christ and the faith. Um, building off of what you just said. Yes. Uh, watch your mouth. Under do? Yeah. Okay. He <laughs> wants. You, know, you give me a little context for that one. Verse ten says, "Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit." Watch your mouth. I like it. Tame your tongue. Uh, that's James, right? Is that James yeah, 1? That's James. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's okay. yes and more, because, like, James 1, is, uh, he, like, outlines, it doesn't matter. He outlines, like, everything he talks about in James 1, and then the rest of the book, he walks through it backwards. Gotcha. So everything in chapter 1. We'll add that to our, we'll add that to our E3 list, too. That sounds like a fun one to really break down, like over several weeks. All right, what else? No, be and do. Personal application out of this text. So, if we're if you're feeling stumped, you can look over here to see what as much of the original audience is and see, okay, what does this look like for us or me individually? Yeah, but for B, you. Have to be baptized through Christ. All right. Yep. Absolutely. What are some things we should know? I'm thinking maybe in this area here. What are some things we should know about this? It's gonna happen. Yep. You will be persecuted in one shape or another. So, question or statement, inversely, if this isn't happening, what does that mean? You're not a true believer? Uh, See, that's, that. that's why, I'm I at, that's why it's that a question far. and a statement. What, so, because so there's a couple layers to this. If this isn't happening to us, I think there's a couple things. One, in years past, it just means well, it's because the nation that you inhabit doesn't particularly hate you yet, <laughs> which is, you know, there's that. That's not a sin, is to live in a place where you're not hated. That's not a sin. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, what you were kind of getting at, I feel like, is if, if you're living in a nation that is hostile to the beliefs you have, and you're not to some degree feeling this, then something might be off, maybe. Um, if you're not living the way in that honor Christ, like if you're living like the world does, and this won't happen. If you're not saying the things that... Christ would say, then, yeah, this won't happen. It's, you know, that yeah, kind of thing. Sure, you can believe, like, in your mind all you want, but unless it's true, like, true in your heart, like, to where if you take your mind out of it, but it's true based on... So, so, so if your Christianity only lives in your head, it's nothing's actually person, going to happen? Yeah, because it's a false sense of reality. The, per, like, it's because sometimes people believe that persecution happens even whatever it doesn't. It's a twisted sense of Well, yeah, we don't want to have, like, a victim complex. No. It's like, not, woe is it, me. It's kind of like going to the James, the what James argues about how faith without works is dead. And like, okay. So, like, it's like, I will show you, this is paraphrasing, I will show you my faith by my works. And, and so I think what you're getting at is, like, there will be some outward showing of Absolutely. your faith. Um, Which will probably, theoretically, eventually that will result opposition. in something like this. Yes, like yes. our showing of your faith will eventually bring like some kind of opposition. And, and and also, it can also, we talked about this maybe a week or two ago, in addition to just this, it's also giving a defense for the hope that's in you. For people to see the hope that's in you, you have to be saying and doing things. And that opens up conversations for you to share the gospel, right? So it, it's a two-way street, um, but yes, it does mean that in living out your faith, you should have those opportunities to really have great gospel conversations, but by extension, it also means that this is a possibility too. Because I don't, what I don't want you to have the impression of is that, well, if you're not being persecuted all the time, you're not a Christian. Well, no, you know that's that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying that at at some level, eventually, there should be some level of discomfort, or that should happen if you're sharing your faith regularly. All right. What else? No, be and do for us. Also on persecution, there's also a level on like 
persecution comes in different ways. Yes. Kind of like Christ, like, sure the Romans didn't care for him, but a lot of his persecution came from the church. Mm-hmm. From uh, from the, the Pharisees. Pharisees and stuff. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Even if you suffer for righteousness, you're still blessed. Like, you will be blessed All right, where would to you like know, to? I think, to yeah. know that. All right, so you will be blessed for suffering for righteousness? Yeah. All right. Uh, that can also go in the B section as well. We know um, in verse 12 that God is with the righteous and he's against those who are unrighteous. Yeah, so to, to, to make that personal, you know, if I'm a, a believer in Christ, God is with me even in suffering. Absolutely. What else? I'm thinking for B, we have a nice list of things at the beginning of our passage. Like in verse 8. Mm-hmm. What are some of those? Being sympathetic. Mm-hmm. So I say sympathetic, unified. What else? Loving. Yep. Humble. tenderhearted. All right? So there's a list. Does anyone remember what we said? I think it was the first week we were in this passage, what we said about this list. If you have this, mm-hmm. you will by default have, have everything the rest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because if you're sympathetic, you can be unified with your brothers and sisters. If you're sympathetic, you can be loving to those who are hurting. If you're sympathetic, you can be humble because you know that you don't always have it all together. If you're sympathetic, you can be tenderhearted for those who are suffering. So, True Christian sympathy will result in all of these by default. And I think we talked briefly about the difference between sympathetic and being empathetic. Empathetic in the current sense of the term is not helpful as a Christian, but true Christian sympathy absolutely is. Uh, Because empathy, you wholly identify with the other person who's hurting, which can make it difficult to make truth claims because sometimes people are hurting because of their own decisions, which means that if you wholly identify with them, you can't point them outside of themselves to something true like the gospel. But if you're sympathetic, you kind of keep one foot in with them, extending a hand, other foot out, being able to give them truth and love uh, in a gentle and loving way, of course, but you, you can still say, hey, um, you're looking for hope. I've got some hope. It's, it's over here in Christ. All right, what else? Uh, I've got one more for no, at least, uh, in verse 22. Anyone want to summarize that for us, something we should know? You know that all, all things so are subject to God. Yep. All right, all things subject to Christ. And I think on the do, do not fear, when it has that section, because I think we naturally, even though we know we suffer for Christ and the good, we we still have that human tendency to fear the uncomfort that comes with it. Discomfort. Uh, And uh, this is where that famous verse, Philippians 4.13, comes in, can do all things. Not so much about shooting the winning three-pointer or hitting the home run, but you can do all things, and all things includes not being afraid of those who are hurting you. All right, anything else under this list? I'll add something under no. I wouldn't call it a stretch, but it's a bit of an inference. Um, so going to verse... Um, 
20 and 21, talking about Noah and baptism, um, I would say we can know that God always planned this redemption. He gives us the Noah and the flood story here as, as confirmation that that was the archetype of what he was going to do in the future, saving people <clears throat> using water as a means. Also, um, parting of the Red Sea, another water salvation metaphor, people of Israel being saved by going through the split sea <clears throat> into uh, the place that God would have for them, fleeing the place that represented death and slavery in Egypt. All right, anything else? No, good, all right. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly or Tara, will you take a picture of this and I'll wipe it and we will get to our um, final question, which is um, how will obedience to these passages uh, uh, affect me, my relationship with God, and reflect uh, affect my relationship with others? So let me know when that's, are we good? No, I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. Yeah, just let me know when you're done. I'll erase it. So start thinking about that. How will obedience to this passage affect me, okay. my relationship with God, and my relationship with others? So this is kind of free form. Thinking about everything we've talked about the last couple weeks, including today, how will obedience to this passage affect me, my relationship with God, and my relationship with others? Not really a right or wrong answer here, so. Well, it should improve both sides of relationship, like both with others with God, if you can understand and apply those things to your life, hopefully. So let's talk about half of that first. So it should improve our relationship with others. How? Well, if you can learn to be sympathetic and understanding of others, then hopefully that will put you in a better position to be able to form a relationship with them and spread the gospel to them or be a witness to them. If you use wisdom and how you approach. Okay. Any other aspects of how obedience this passage would improve my relationship with other people? Um, when it talks about the unity of mind with other Christians, we have the same aim. It kind of refocuses our minds to that fact. Yeah. So, you know, uh, one thing, so I, I don't know about you all, and at some point we really just need to take like a week and just like share testimonies because I don't know if y'all know me or where I come from or how God got a hold of my life, and I don't know necessarily that about all of you. So one week we just need to sit down and do that. But for me, I grew up in a very different church than this one. One thing that I've grown to really love about being part of the Southern Baptist Convention is that while I'm sure we have theological, minor theological differences with other churches, and maybe even inside this room or inside this church, there's a great unity of mind among Southern Baptist churches because we focus on the thing that matters most, which is getting the gospel out to the nations and, and to our own. So that's one thing that I've really appreciated about being here is that emphasis and focus on the thing that matters most, and that's getting the gospel out. And that only you can only achieve that on the scale that they achieve that when you have unity of mind with other believers. It's not to say that other denominations can't have that or we can't have that with them on certain issues, but just as a practical example for where we are in the church that we're in, that's something that I find really, really neat. 
that I didn't grow up with. Right. Anything else? That was a great point. Anything else with the relationship with others? Okay. All right, well then, what's the other half of what Andrew said? How would this change my relationship with God if I'm obedient to these passages? The more that you study and the more that you're like obedient to it, it's going to show in your life more so that you that you can witness to people. I guess that one can go in that, that section, right? Yeah. Can so, interchange? Yeah, so I'm going to say his ability to spread his word. And I'm also going to say, kind of going on your first part, grow in sanctification. Have we all heard that word at least once? No. Sanctification, growing in holiness, becoming more like Christ. And as you say, that really only happens through studying the word and, and prayer, growing and in Like prayer. being obedient to the, in verse 8, like where it says, be sympathetic, have unity of mind, all that. Yeah. yeah, and working out your relationships with other people will also help you grow in sanctification because... I don't think it's really a it's controversy to say that people can be difficult. And if you can learn to be um, gracious and sympathetic and tenderhearted and that sort of thing, that will help your own sanctification too. I've never been difficult at all, so I don't know. Um, mm. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I said that because she's not here. Um, <laughs> all right. Anything else in our in terms of our relationship with God? I mean, there's kind of a big one. We may yeah. not be thinking of it right now because we've already taken that step, but there's kind of a, kind of a big one. For other folks, what? Oh, I was thinking baptism. There. Yeah, yeah, the, you have, get it being but, saved. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you're obedient to this, you're if you're baptized mm-hmm. with Christ and His life, death, and resurrection, then that's kind of a big deal in your relationship <laughs> with God, right? So, uh, I think like definitely knowing like that. Jesus has like all authority like that definitely affects your relationship with him um obviously kind of like Josh was saying this morning like we shouldn't be trying to do things in our own power yeah uh, I like this yeah that was a great point he made about you know you can you can work really hard and if it's not from God or through him, then you might build something, but it's just going to be a house of cards and the slightest breeze can knock it over. But the, the house that God builds is not going to be shaken. Absolutely. That also makes me think about uh, what we said a few minutes ago about suffering and being able to, to do that, endure that. Um, you know, it all being under doing it through Christ is what makes it possible, not because we're so strong or so brave or so bold that we can withstand all that persecution. It's, it's from the power of God. Absolutely. All right, what else? Having the understanding that we can look to Christ and his example for how he endured suffering and that's all throughout the entire scriptures. Also, when you referred back to Noah, how God had like the long planned plan of redemption, um, his plan of redemption for our lives as well. It puts it into a really kind of big picture perspective, and, and that should humble us and make us so grateful for His for His grace that even as far back as as Noah, and, and really even be before that in Genesis three, um, the garden and the, the the first gospel, the the proto evangelion, where He says the woman will give birth, the seed will crush the serpent. Um, Think about it in in that aspect, just the the massive scale and His plan should produce like humble and adoring love in us that he thinks he thought of us even then it's incredible to think about 
this has been awesome so far. Anything else under relationship with others? You know what you said about sympathy and how like sympathy can lead to all the other mm -hmm. characteristics? I feel like those characteristics each can like inhibit you from giving sympathy to. Like if you lack in a certain characteristic, I feel like that might it like prevent you from being more sympathetic. Like it. So if you if you're not tender-hearted, you can't be sympathetic. I'm not saying you can be. I think it goes both ways. Like yes, being sympathetic leads to all those, but I feel like if you struggle in one of those, it can maybe prevent you from being more sympathetic. Yeah, yeah. So if you've got a hard heart, mm -hmm. it's gonna be hard for you to be sympathetic. Exactly. Yeah. And that can manifest itself by not being tender with other people. Um, this kind of goes with like the witnessing to others, but like because it talks about like being gentle and respectful. <clears throat> So, uh, I've got a question for discussion. How much time do we have? We got a few minutes at the least. Um, so we have clear instruction uh, in this passage that when we are um, dealing with others, we're to be gentle and respectful, particularly in the area when we're sharing the gospel with them. Uh, I sometimes feel this way, and I'm curious to hear what you have to say, uh, that in our current context, that's really hard. And I feel like that's hard because the uh, attacks from the other side are pretty pretty heavy on the, the malice, I guess. And so what I guess I'm getting at, sometimes I feel like to, to get the idea across is you've got to have a certain edge to what you're presenting. Am I making sense? Like you can't, like if you have to be gentle and respectful, but you also can't be pudding. Does that make sense? Where you know you're just <clears throat> taking whatever false accusations or worldview assumptions from other people. You can't just hear that and be like, oh, okay. So you have to you have to respond with gentleness and respect, but it, you also have to stand firm and not you know break under whatever it is they're throwing at you or accept without reservation assumptions that people with other worldviews would make. So, I don't know, don't be pudding, be jello, retaining your shape but flexible, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> that was awesome. Like the dessert. <laughs> I thought you meant like P-U-T-T. -T That's what I thought, too. I didn't know uh, it was like, no, I don't know. Did, did, I, did really I pronounce that wrong? Pudding. Yeah, I thought you were saying no, yeah, T-T, and I was no. like... No, don't, don't, be, don't be like really pudding for really dessert. Pudding. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Be like jello. <laughs> Firm enough to hold your shape, but... Um, flexible enough to handle whatever gets thrown at you, I guess, is That's what I'm great. trying to say. I think that also does get, does get like circumstantial on like who these others are. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like there are some people that, you know, like your demeanor will have a great effect on like their ability to listen to your reason, but there are some people who just, they've already made up their mind, you can't change it no matter what your demeanor is. Yeah. Yeah, so someone might hear your presentation of the gospel better than they might hear mine, for instance. Yeah, and then and it's like some people like they just don't care at all. So like I think in those kind of scenarios, it's like it's okay to like like to like focus on like that gentleness and respect and not trying to force your answer if they don't want to hear it. Because yeah. you can't evangelize right by force. Yeah. Well, at least at least not successfully, and or at least not that will be genuine. <laughs> You know, you know, uh, we've had we're plenty of historical examples where both the Christian church has tried that and where other religions have tried that, and in neither case does evangelism by sword work very well long term. It's, it's kind of like, uh, though, you have to do, do, like, you can be respectful, but you have to do, like, a you have to come across strong in what you believe. It's like you have to be confident in what you believe, because if you're not strong in what you believe in your faith, and some people are going to see that and be like, well, he doesn't really believe this. I, I it's like you have to be like you have to make sure that you're firmly rooted in what you believe while being respectful it's kind of like a hard line to walk sometimes especially with how you have to approach different types of people because some people they'll just come at you yeah. and if you don't come off in a way that's like genuine but strong at the same time they will just disregard whatever you say because they're like well he doesn't really believe it so he doesn't know and I, I think that so. gets into to like change again is like the um, faith by work um, is like a lot of people they're going to see your works first 
and like what you say doesn't matter if your work don't follow it. And so I think some of that gentleness is expected, like, um, to trust that um, your actions will speak louder than your words. Um, and like, I think it's okay to like lead by your work and like how you should live your life and just like they will see like that um, and like that can lead them to the gospel as much as your words can, if not more. Okay. I think to tie it all together, um, there is a contrast like in being filled with grace and being filled with truth of scripture. And so when it comes to like ministering to others, it is finding that direct balance of both grace and truth to meet people exactly where they are because we are just as messed up as them, except we are living in the grace that God has given to us. But also that can't turn you away from the truth of the wrath of God. Um, and Matthew eleven twenty nine. Um, it says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Um, I, that's like one of the main characteristics of God, is that he is gentle and lowly. There's a great book by Dane Orland called Gentle and Lowly, um, and it goes into that characteristic specifically of God. Um, but let that kind of be your characteristic when you are discipling others or um, witnessing to others as well. Yep, can't have one without the other. It's gotta be both. <clears throat> Something that I was taught is that um, you have to look at everyone as they are made in the image of God. And that kind of brings us to that respect of they are God's creation and we are also God's creation. And that just kind of builds that mutual respect for each other. Yep. Yeah, and the, that, rec that recognition <clears throat> that everyone's made in the image of God uh, also, like you said, helps us do this because they're not, there's no one more superior than us and there's no one that we're more superior than. Absolutely. Um, and I, I would submit that the truth of this being lost is partly why um, institutions like slavery existed as long as they did in predominantly Christian nations. Because if you actually believe this, you will hate slavery. Mm -hmm. If you believe this, you will hate abortion. If you believe this, you will hate the mistreatment of any people group at any time in any place. So if you, if you don't understand this, and value it, then, you know, sure, you can abuse people because they're, they're, they're not really this. Well, then I can do whatever I want to them. But I think the recovery of this really is something that helped uh, foster the demise of, of certain institutions in history. Uh, and I believe it, it's Christian thought that led to that. Um, and sadly, it took far longer than it should have for that to happen, but that's history. And I think that's where you see like the cultural issues of identity being so lost and misconstrued because we forget that we're made in the image of God. And so it's like we're trying to find like our purpose and our being and like who the world like says we should be or says that we are because um, we're missing out on who God has already said that we are. And that's, called spirit. that's so good because if you if you don't if you either don't understand or refuse to recognize this truth, then you're going to be searching for you to essentially create yourself in whatever image you conjure up, which can lead you down all kinds of tragic paths um, in, in lots of different ways. So, to... That's a great point. So, embarrassing life group leader moment. I technically don't know when we're supposed to end. When are we supposed to end, Cameron? When does well, the next service start? Like, what, 11? Like, so we're supposed to end, like, 10 to 15 minutes before the service.
which is which it starts at 11 so like we got we, got we have like time. nine minutes plus basically yeah okay we got plenty of time okay just to give that buffer of transition time which most of us are not going to that service so it doesn't really matter this is also true but there are some there are some yes and if at any point on any week anyone needs to leave early to head to the third service you please just go and don't don't no apologies just head on out we don't want you to be late for service. Um, all right, anything else to add here? Or even not necessarily in these two categories, but anything, because this is our third week in this passage, any thoughts, reflections that you've had as we've been reading and studying before we leave this uh, leave this section? Uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but like well, everything we've been talking about, about like the grace and truth and like our relationship of others, it would make me think of a Hebrew word, um, it's a uh, hasid, and it, it's, do you know that word? Loving kindness? It, it's typically translated as yep. loving kindness or steadfast love. Yep. But it's like a really hard word to translate. Um, kind of like, um, a, it's like a super like divine, unconditional love. And like an underlying thing about it is like loving people who you know will never love you back. And so it's like a truly like, um, like you're never going to get anything out of that kind of love. Like you get nothing in return. So it's like the truthful, like honest, um, loving other people, um, did like, despite like who they are, what they are, kind of like that, like most of the time when it's in the Bible, it's about like God's hostage, mm -hmm. um, and it's like God loves us, but then like every single person who has ever lived and will ever live, um, like it doesn't matter if you go to church or not. Like all of us are sinners. We all like they screw you to God in some way or another. Um, and it's that He's still there. And so it's, it's like a lot of that. And I think like that should kind of be like the goal behind all of this with the re relationship with others. It like really have that our understanding of it doesn't matter how um, other people will look back at you like you still have that same kind of love yeah um, so let me try to find the right reference here so I thought it was in Deuteronomy but I think I'm wrong Where is that from? are you looking for a flow to anger about it it's in Exodus yep 34-6 Thank you, sir. First time. Fun fact, that yeah. is the most quoted verse in the Old Testament within the whole Old, Old Testament. Like it's it Isaiah. Like when Old Testament authors Isaiah? quote Hosea. other books, oh, Hosea. that's the one they quote the most. Interesting. I did not know like, that. I think it's yeah, so Exodus like 34, 6. So this like is, and for context, this like is when Moses is remaking the, the tablets. Um, and Moses, or the Lord says to Moses, he said, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord of God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children, the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. So in that passage, uh, steadfast love, yeah, so steadfast love is chesed, uh, which is what you're talking about. Uh, so in the ESV, it's translating it as steadfast love. I think most translations do steadfast love. Yes, yeah, I've also heard loving kindness, hyphenated, which I don't think you see anywhere else anywhere, this, this hyphenated version of, of these two words, um, which I think, I think that's also a fair translation, but um, steadfast love is a little easier for us to work with in terms of reading and explaining to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, does anyone else have a different translation on them? What does what um, NKJV say, Andrew? Okay, what reference? Exodus 34 6. Exodus 34 6, because I was hearing Hosea and Deuteronomy, and I was okay. trying to look at Hosea, but it's Exodus. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's the uh, most quoted one. That's yeah, why yeah, it would, yeah, yeah. That's why it's the most quoted. Be in your brain. Yeah, yep. Fair enough. It's in Jonah. We'll get to it again. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, the, by the way, while Andrew pulls that up, um, I got it. Uh, Jeremy told me the other day, uh, we will be the test for an addition to E3 that's specific for Old Testament narrative. 
So um, mm -hmm. I've got papers that I'll give out when we get there. Um, it'll be kind of what we'll kind of be testing out um, in addition to, so you have the E3 like binder rings with the different ways you do it. Well, it's just, this is just a piece of paper, but it'll be something they would consider adding to that ring specifically for Old Testament stuff. Help out with the narrative. Gotcha. Okay. okay, Andrew, what does it say? 34 6. Yes, sir. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Interesting. That's, that's different even than. All right. Good word study. All right. Uh, any other comments? Uh, not necessarily related to this, but just in this passage in general? I was thinking about what Hannah said about identity. It reminded me of something I heard a long time ago about how everybody's so concerned with their own identity. I, can't remember. I heard a term once said that people tend to have a graven image of self. Ooh. Do you know where that's from? I, I really don't remember. I don't know whether that was something that just came while I was studying the Bible or whether I heard it from someone else. But it's like the idea is that most people, God is what they look at in the mirror every morning. And it's kind of like the same way with like when people are searching for their identities and trying to find their identity and their whole their whole mindset is wrapped up in their identity. Like you see people do that all the time nowadays. Like that is that is all the that's like their personality. That's what they base their life off of. Like what they identify as. So I don't know. I just kind of just kind of came to me when Adam was talking about that. Yeah, and and this is particularly insidious because it this can easily affect not just mm -hmm. the other. This can easily affect us as well. Yeah, my job, my mm -hmm. spouse. My girlfriend, my boyfriend, uh, my the things I do outside of work, um, my life, my goals, my love. Hundred percent. That's a great point. If you ever find out who said that, I'd like to know. I'll see if I can find. I can see if I can get that up. All right. Anything else? This has been a real. I really have enjoyed that we got to do three weeks on this um, because I feel like the rest of this book we're going to move a little fast through especially chapter five we might get that done in like a week and change um, chapter four will probably take us two weeks but uh, before we know we'll be in Jonah um, and I'm excited about that uh, but that will also be very different for us uh, that'll be very different for us but I'm excited to see how we tackle it um, especially with the additional resource we've been given for E3 so uh, if there's no other comments um I'll pray for us, and y'all can hang out in here, go get some more food from the loft, or uh, if you need to go to the next service, you can go reserve your seat, um, and I'll pray and I'll close us out. Lord, thank you so much for today. We thank you for the truth of your word um, and how it instructs us to be both, uh, to stand for truth, but also to do so uh, graciously and humbly uh, with mildness uh, and not out of um, self-righteousness or, or, or aggression, Lord, but just to love you and to love other people. Uh, to give your truth to the world. We thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for the time we have and the opportunity just to love you uh, through attending worship service and those who are going to go to the next service. Lord, we thank you for these opportunities. We pray that as we go from this place, you would, uh, through the power of your spirit, uh, inhabit our hands and feet, that we would love all those we come into contact with, that we would be bold um, but gentle in the way that we speak about our faith to others, that we would continue devoting our time and our energy to loving your word, to study it, to, for it to be a part of our hearts, uh, be written on them. We love you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> um, will someone snap a quick picture of this? Oh, yeah.